Uh, all right, Tom, we are live on our YouTube channel today. So thank you very much for joining the session and accepting the invitation and being our guest speaker today. It's so wonderful to have you today. And I think um, it's really excited to learn more about Kansas State. Uh, and so let's wait a few seconds. Just our viewers can receive notifications and will join us soon. So it takes some time. <laughs> Oh, our first viewers already join us. Uh, good evening, dear friends, Bishkek American Center followers. Hope you're all doing great and well these days. And uh, we are very happy to continue our regular program, uh, virtual US state tours. And today we are going to visit Kansas State. And it's my great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, Tom Becker. Uh, he's a retired lawyer, lawyer living in Iowa and where he remains active in teaching at the local community college. And he also conducts training for the Iowa State Public Defenders System. He also mentors uh, law students uh, and serve, serves as a president of the Iowa chapter of the American Society for Public Administration. And once again, uh, Tom, thank you very much. And we are really excited uh, to learn more about Kansas State. And I also would like to kindly remind our viewers, so don't forget to send your questions during the live. Uh, you can uh, type them in the comments. And after the presentation, Tom will answer them. So now uh, I'm passing the word to you, Tom. Thank you, Idea. Uh, should I show your presentation? Yes. Go ahead and show the slides. There you go. Oh. That's it. Okay. Here. There we are. All right. And when it's time to move to the next slide, I will I will let you know. Well, hello again, everyone. Um, as Aida uh, said in her kind introduction, uh, my name is Tom Becker. And I am a native of the state of Kansas in the United States of America. Uh, I like it kind of says on the slide, Kansas is known as the sunflower state. That's the state's official motto because so many sunflowers uh, grow there. Uh, the sunflower is, I say, is actually in the Kansas state flag that you see there uh, uh, right at the top. Now, I don't know if sunflowers grow in Kyrgyzstan. I don't, probably, I don't think they do. Uh, uh, you have a very mountainous region and uh, it's probably it's not friendly to to grow sunflowers uh, but if you haven't seen one before there's a picture there on the slide it, it is not only a very pretty flower it is a source of food uh, you, you you can't tell from the picture on the slide but the, the sunflower is very large um, it grows uh, to a height of over two meters uh, uh, the center of the flower is a very large you know seed pod and, uh, and it has uh, typically uh, over a thousand seeds in it and they can be eaten. Uh, 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 sunflower seeds that are salted and bagged up are a very popular and tasty snack uh, in the United States and Kansas supplies those uh, seeds for uh, uh, much of the rest of the nation. Now, before we go on, uh, I wanna you know, add a little bit to uh, Aida's uh, introduction, tell you a little bit more about me. Now, I was born in Kansas City, uh, you'll see where that is on the next map that I uh, uh, that that I show you, or one of the maps that I show you. And I was raised in a, a small town near Kansas City. Uh, the name of that town is uh, Prairie Village. Now, Prairie is a word in English. If you're familiar with it, it kind of describes what Kansas looks like. Uh, you may be more familiar with the English word step. Um, you know, uh, I know uh, near, in nearby uh, in, in Russia, there are areas of Russia that look very much like Kansas. Um, uh, they call all they call the steps. It means the same thing. You know, basically just miles of open fields with very few trees. Uh, now, after finishing high school, I went to college in Kansas in Topeka, Kansas, uh, at Washburn University. Uh, Washburn University was founded in uh, 1865 
And it was at that time, it was named Lincoln College. It was named after Abraham Lincoln, uh, a president of the United States, a very important president who was uh, uh, murdered, assassinated just a few months before um, the, uh, uh, the founding of Lincoln uh, College. So it was Lincoln College for about 40 years, but then it changed its name to Washburn College, later Washburn University. It was named after a man by the name of Ichabod Washburn, who donated twenty thousand dollars to the college, which in you know, which in you know, uh, the eighteen nineties, uh, 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 nineteen hundred, that was a whole lot of money. Uh, and uh, so they were so grateful that they renamed the college after him. And in fact, the the athletic teams uh, uh, that play for Washburn are nicknamed the Ichabods after after his first name. So Washburn University also has a law school. And so after I graduated from the college, the university, you know, I went to the Washburn University School of Law and became a lawyer in 1977. You know, after that, I joined the United States Air Force. I was a military lawyer uh, called uh, a judge advocate. And uh, I was I stayed in the Air Force until 1999 when I retired from the Air Force. Uh, I then went to live in the state of Iowa, uh, where I uh, served as the head, as I just said, of the, of the state agency uh, that provides legal services to people who are accused of crimes, uh, who are too poor to hire their own lawyer. Uh, uh, that's called the state. That job was called the state public defender. Um, so after 10 years in Iowa, I, I, I returned to the Air Force as a civilian worker. I wasn't I wasn't a military officer then, but I was I was hired as a civilian worker and I was the academic director at uh, the school, the Air Force school that teaches its new lawyers military law. So I did that for 10 years and then I retired in 2019 and returned to Iowa where I live now. You know, I, although I don't work for a living anymore, you know, as, uh, as Aida said, I still teach. I teach in the paralegal program at a local community college. Uh, if you're not familiar with the word paralegal in English, uh, it's the term for a legal assistant that helps out a lawyer. It's kind of the same relationship as a nurse is to a physician, as a, as a doctor. So anyway, that's enough about me. Uh, I, I'm here to talk about where I was born and raised, the native state of Kansas, of which I'm very proud, and I still have uh, family living there. Um, uh, as you can see from, from this map, the state of Kansas, uh, it's circled there, is right in the middle of the 48 states that make up what is what is called the continental United States. You know, if you're familiar with um, American history and geography at all, you know that there's two other states that, that aren't shown here on this map. Alaska, which is uh, you know, way far in the northwest, it actually borders on Canada up in the northwest, and also Hawaii the group of islands that's 2,000 miles out into the Pacific Ocean to the west of the continental uh, United States. But, you know, the 48 states that make up most of the United States are, are, are shown here on this map. And as you can see, Kansas is right in the very middle of it. Uh, in fact, the geographic, the exact geographic center of the continental United States is in Kansas. It, you see that photo in the lower left of the slide. There's actually a monument that was constructed there in the exact mm -hmm. geographic center of, of, the, of the United States. It's located in a town called uh, Lebanon, Kansas, that's named after the country of Lebanon. Uh, and um, uh, it's kind of located, if you see on the map there, the word Kansas, the name Kansas, where the second A is just before the S, uh, it's just mm -hmm. above there. Uh, that's where Lebanon, Kansas is and where the exact center of the United States is. Next slide, please. Now, here's a closer up view uh, of Kansas uh, showing a few landmarks. As you can see, you know, Kansas is bordered on the east by Missouri. Uh, Oklahoma uh, borders it to the south. Uh, Colorado is to the west and Nebraska is to the north. Now, I was uh, born and raised in the Kansas City area. Uh, in the northeast area of the state. You can see there, the uh, there's two cities, Mark, Kansas City. One is in Kansas, one is in Missouri. Uh, I, I, I was born and, and raised there. The, the, the bigger city is in Missouri, Kansas City. Uh, but there is that smaller one across the border in Kansas uh, uh, where I am from. Yeah. Now, uh, uh, other major cities in Kansas are Topeka, which is the capital. That's where the governor and the state legislature, uh, I think in, in Kyrgyzstan, your parliament uh, legislature is called the Supreme Council. Uh, 
So that's the, the Kansas equivalent of that. Uh, the, the legislature is is in Topeka along with the governor, and they're in that building that you see there, the photo at the top of the slide, which is the Kansas State uh, uh, Capitol building. Uh, Topeka, like I said before, is also where I went to college and law school at Washburn University. But as fine a university as Washburn is, the biggest and most prestigious university in Kansas is the University of Kansas, which is located in Lawrence, Kansas. And you can see a photo of the, uh, the campus of the University of uh, Kansas there on the right side of the slide. Now, the largest city in Wichita, or in the state, is Wichita, uh, uh, which has about 400,000 people in it. So it's a little, uh, for comparison purposes, it's a little larger uh, than Osh and about, uh, about half the size of Bishkek. Uh, uh, the whole state of Kansas has about 3 million people uh, living there. Uh, now just south of Wichita, you see the, uh, the photo there, is the location of the largest grain storage facility in the world. You see that picture there. This is very important because Kansas is one of the, the world's largest producers of wheat and other grain. And a lot of that is exported to other countries. I try to do a little research as to whether uh, uh, Kansas wheat has found its way into uh, 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 Kyrgyzstan, and uh, may maybe you make bread from that there. I don't know. I could not find out. But it wouldn't surprise me uh, if, uh, if Kansas wheat makes its way to Kyrgyzstan because uh, we, uh, Kansas exports to much of the world. Next slide, please. Oh, wait. No, you can stay there. Stay there. Uh, uh, in, the, in western Kansas, you see there is the city of Dodge City, uh, which is a very small city. It's only about 27,000 people that live there, uh, but it is important in Kansas culture and also American culture and history. Um, I don't know whether you've seen many American movies about what we call our Wild West period, you know, in the late 1800s. You know, uh, Dodge City is important to that. There are lots of stories about you know, famous lawmen and gunfighters that are connected to Dodge City, uh, several of whom are buried in Kansas's, uh, uh, Dodge City's famous cemetery, which is called uh, Boot Hill. Now you can move on. Mm -hmm. Next one. Now, but uh, you, uh, you can't talk about Kansas culture without talking about the Native Americans, the Indians who were there long before white settlers uh, arrived uh, in Kansas. You know, um, uh, you see the Indian tribes on the map uh, uh, that, uh, that lived in Kansas when white settlers began arriving. Uh, you can see that one of the tribes is called the Kansas, uh, uh, which actually gave uh, its name to the state uh, in the in uh, the uh, Kansas Native Kansas literally means land of the Kansas. Uh, uh, in many places in Kansas have names that originated in Native American language, you know, such as the capital city, Topeka. Uh, that is a Kansas word, which means a good place to grow potatoes. Uh, uh, Wichita is, is named after the tribe that you see on, on the map. Uh, I graduated from a high school in the Kansas City area that was called Shawnee Mission High School. Uh, and uh, that was named after a Christian missionary school that was established for the Shawnee a tribe of Indians in eastern Kansas in the Kansas City area. There are many more Kansas name uh, Kansas places that have uh, Indian names, and that's actually true throughout the United States. Now, there are four uh, Indian reservations that are still in Kansas: uh, the Iowa Reservation, uh, the Kickapoo Tribe. There are two reservations that belong to the Prairie Band of the Potawatomi Nation, and then there's the Sac and Fox uh, Reservation. Members of these tribes continue to honor their heritage and their culture as independent people, as well as being a community uh, members of the state of Kansas. Under American law, um, Indian tribes are allowed to retain their, their, their government independent uh, from uh, the United States and surrounding states. So, uh, uh, and that is true in Kansas as well as other states. Now, you know, for a long time in United States history, uh, Native Americans, Indians, were the main residents of Kansas, even as other states further west were, became populated by white settlers that came uh, from the eastern United States. Now, those settlers just passed through Kansas on the way uh, west, to specifically to Oregon or California, and they didn't start settling in Kansas until the mid-1800s. 
Next slide, please. After a war between the United States and the country of Mexico in the 1840s, uh, the United States ended up receiving from Mexico uh, territory uh, that is now the state of California. Um, and about the same time, the United States and England, Great Britain, uh, settled a, a, a territorial dispute between the United States and the British uh, colony of Canada. Uh, and uh, as a result uh, from that, uh, the state of what became the state of Oregon in the northwest of the United States became a United States territory. So at about this same time, then we got this large area that became California and uh, another large area, a little smaller than California, but still important. Uh, that became uh, Oregon Territory in the United States. And that was very attractive for settlers from the east part of the United States to go there uh, and take advantage of land that was available for them to, to farm. Yeah. So uh, now you have both Oregon and California open to white settlers from the eastern United States. Now, how did they get there? Well, they got there by way of, of, of wagon train. Uh, the uh, like you see on the drawing on the on the lower right, a family moving out west would basically, you know, they would buy a covered wagon and they would load up all their children and belongings and the family dog, and and uh, they would spend many months in a train of wagons heading to either Oregon or California on the Pacific Coast. And to do that, they took one of two major trails, major you know, highways, if you will, the trails, wagon trails, both of which started in the Kansas City, Missouri area, uh, just over from the border of Kansas, and passed through Kansas on the way west. Now, the Oregon Trail that you see mapped on the top of the slide, uh, that didn't, that didn't uh, spend too much time in Kansas. It went through the northeast part of the state. Uh, but the Santa Fe Trail, uh, that you see in the lower left, that went all the way through the state of Kansas and ended up in the New Mexico territory, uh, specifically the city of Santa Fe. And from there, depending on where in California the settlers were going, they took you know different trails uh, from there. But the, to be able to get to those trails, they had to pass entirely through Kansas on the Santa Fe Trail. Now, you might wonder why they passed through Kansas, you know, without without uh, uh, staying. You know, the trip all the way to Oregon and California was very long and very dangerous. Uh, you know, the Oregon Trail passed through mountains that were extremely, you know, there was no, you know, it was uh, very few passes through the mountains that they had to go through. Uh, the Santa Fe Trail went through deserts. Um, uh, uh, and, and a lot of the, the, the time, uh, the Indian tribes in the areas were still hostile to uh, these uh, white uh, people coming in from uh, the east. And so that was dangerous uh, to them as well. So you wondered, why didn't they stop and just stay in Kansas? Well, I'll show you why. Next picture, please. Next one. The, the reason why is when these folks got to Kansas, this is all they saw. You know, this is what Kansas looked like in the, you know, the early to mid 1800s. It was very flat, uh, maybe some rolling ground like that, but there were no trees growing anywhere. Now, the white settlers from the eastern United States were used to heavily forested land, which was an indication to them that you could grow things there. You can grow crops there, that the land was fertile. And when they saw this, they said, well, well, nothing's going to grow here, so we don't want to stay here. Let's go to California. Let's go to Oregon. Uh, the, the area of Kansas and other states in the central United States that, that look, kind of look like Kansas uh, uh, are now called the Great Plains, like the Great Steppes of, of Russia and uh, the Ukraine. Uh, but they're called the Great Plains here. Uh, but when uh, the eastern United States settlers first saw it, they named it the Great American Desert. Uh, because they didn't think anything could grow here. Well, they were wrong. Uh, they should have asked the Native American tribes that were, that were there. They would have told them how fertile uh, the land was, how how rich and black the soil it was, and it could grow almost any food crop. The fact that no trees grew there wasn't important. It could grow lots of things to eat. Um, uh, but nobody knew that at the time. 
you. Now, the biggest problem with growing crops in Kansas uh, uh, at this time was the weather, which was very harsh in winter. But that problem was solved by immigrants from Russia, which I'll explain soon. I'm a descendant from those immigrants, so I like to talk about it. Next slide. So originally, Kansas was just a pass-through place for white settlers from the east of the United States on the way to the far west, on the way to Oregon or California. But that changed, you know, starting in like the middle 1800s, when Kansas became important as a food distribution center uh, for the rest of the United States. And, and cities were established to support that food distribution system. You know, it began with the railroad coming to Kansas uh, from back east. You know, there were no trains in Kansas until about the, the middle 1800s. Uh, that provided a means for beef cattle uh, raised down south in, in Texas uh, to be shipped back east by train if the, if the cattle uh, could somehow get from Texas uh, to where the railroad was. Uh, the result was a cattle drive. Uh, along what became known as the Chisholm Trail, named after a Texas cattle baron by the name of John Chisholm, who was the first to drive his cattle from Texas through Oklahoma to the railroad heads uh, that you see there on the map in Kansas, in Wichita, Newton, and Abilene, Kansas. Uh, now, these cattle drives had just thousands of heads of cattle in them, as you can see from the painting that's in the upper right, but they were all managed by just a few cowboys on horseback. You know, the drive would, you know, cattle drives would take months, uh, and when the cattle arrived at their destinations in Kansas, you know, those cowboys were ready to have a party. Next slide. Mm -hmm which was why uh, some Kansas towns got a reputation for some pretty wild behavior, you know, including a lot of gun violence, uh, you know, during the, the this was during the, the cattle drive day. You know, in towns like Abilene and Dodge City, which I've already mentioned, you know, there were many a gunfighter and lawman, you know, earned his reputation there. You know, uh, one group for breaking the law and the other group were trying to enforce it and trying to make the kind of wild cow towns, as they were called, uh, safe for families and other businesses uh, to, to settle and operate. You know, as a result, like I say, cemeteries like the, the Boot Hill Cemetery in Dodge City, you know, became very busy. But eventually, law and order prevailed. Next slide, please. So, so you know, after things settled down and more families settled and discovered what had been called the Great American Desert was actually some of the best soil in the world for growing crops, especially wheat, as you see here. You know, Kansas has become uh, the nation's and one of the world's most important producers of wheat for a, a, a world market. And it became that way largely because of the contributions of a group of people that immigrated to Kansas from uh, Russia. And they were known as the Volga Germans. Uh, my family on my father's side is, a, uh, is from Volga German stock. The name Becker is a German name, and it's very common among Volga Germans. Uh, um, uh, whenever I, I meet someone named uh, Becker, I always ask them, uh, you know, if they came from uh, uh, Poland or German uh, ancestry and, and, you know, about maybe, oh, a quarter or a third of the time they answer, they answer yes. Next slide. The Volga Germans came from the part of Russia that you see here marked by the green arrow. Uh, uh, they came to, to Russia from Germany uh, during the, the 1700s when Empress Catherine the Great of Russia offered free land in the lower part of the Volga River uh, if people were willing to come and settle in the area and farm the land. Um, you know, many people from Germany took that offer. Uh, they were allowed a great deal of freedom after they got there to govern themselves and to keep their language and custom. You know, and that continued after the fall of the, um, uh, of the Russian Empire and uh, when the Soviet Union was created, they still allowed a lot of autonomy down in the, uh, uh, the Volga German, uh, German area. Um, that kind of ended in, in World War II. There was some natural uh, distrust 
of uh, ancestral Germans who continue to speak German uh, when the Nazis invaded in 1941. Uh, and uh, but you know, none, none, nonetheless, though the Volga Germans for most of their time in, in, so, in Russia and the Soviet Union were allowed a lot of, uh, of freedoms. Now, after about a hundred years there, though, um, uh, many Volga German families, including my own uh, family, decided to emigrate to the United States. And in particular, you know, they emigrated to a part of the United States that looked a lot where they lived in Russia. Uh, they immigrated to the central United States, many of them settling in Kansas. And they brought their farming experience and their skills with them. You, know, you see on uh, that slide there, that little flag, that's the unofficial flag of the Volga German community. Uh, it's not official. It's just that uh, uh, people that kind of adopted that to symbolize uh, the Volga German uh, culture. Um, note that in the center is a drawing of a stalk of wheat. Now, this symbolizes the, the most important contribution of the Volga German people, in particular to Kansas. Uh, the Volga Germans developed a type of wheat that was called hard winter wheat. Uh, the name comes from the fact that the wheat was very resilient, very tough stuff, and, and could withstand extremely cold temperatures. So it could be planted in the fall, in the autumn, and survive during the cold months of the winter and then grow until it was harvested in the summer. Now this allowed two full crops of wheat each year. The regular spring wheat, which uh, was planted in the spring during warm weather and then harvested in the fall before it got cold. Uh, and then the winter wheat that was planted in the autumn and survived over the winter and then grew and then was harvested in the summer. Now imagine what that meant to food food supply. You could double production that way. And that was the contribution of the Volga Germans. They brought that hard winter wheat to the United States, in particular states like Kansas where it, it was grown. And, and this ended up making Kansas what's called the breadbasket of the United States and much of the world. Uh, yeah, much of the bread that is made really in many places of the world originated, was grown in Kansas and uh, 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 was exported from there. Next slide, please, Aida. So agriculture, farming and ranching uh, remains Kansas's top industry even to this day. In addition to wheat, uh, Kansas grows a lot of corn uh, and crops that are used to feed livestock like hay, and uh, something called alfalfa. I don't know whether you have alfalfa in Kyrgyzstan. You can tell when, uh, when it's alfalfa season because the smell is very pungent. Uh, uh, not Cows love to eat it, but I don't like the smell. <laughs> when, when you drive by uh, grain storage facilities, you can always tell when there's alfalfa there because it smells uh, very bad. Um, and, but because of that abundance of, of feed, um, the Kansas livestock industry is now, you know, one of America's largest, you know, primarily beef cattle. Uh, they don't have to bring them up from Texas anymore. They, they raise them right in, in Kansas now. But Kansas is not about just about farming and ranching. Uh, uh, there are other industries as well. Um, Kansas produces a lot of petroleum, oil, uh, oil and natural gas. It's uh, ranked number 11 out of the 50 states of the United States for the uh, petroleum, uh, oil, and gas production. Um, you know, Kansas is also a leader in the aviation industry uh, uh, with the Boeing company, which has a major factory in, in Wichita. Boeing is one of the largest manufacturers of aircraft uh, in the world. They sell them all over. If you've done any traveling by train or train, by plane, by aircraft rather, uh, it, it is very likely that you've flown on a, an airplane that was manufactured by the Boeing company. Next slide. In, in fact, one of Kansas's most famous citizens was one of America's greatest uh, aviation pioneers back in the early part of the, of the 20th century, the 1900s. Uh, her name was Amelia Earhart, and she was born and raised in Atchison, Kansas, which is in the northeast uh, part of the state, uh, north of, Can of the Kansas City area. Uh, she held a number of world records in aviation until, you know, and she was trying to get another one, 
uh, when she disappeared. She was trying to be the first woman to fly all the way around the world, and she ended up disappearing in the Central Pacific Ocean uh, in 1937. They, they never, there's a lot of speculation as to what happened to her, uh, uh, but certainly she never arrived at, at where her next uh, stopping place was going to be. And uh, no doubt that she went down in the ocean and uh, was, was lost there. Now, another very famous uh, Kansan was Dwight D. Eisenhower, who was uh, from Abilene in central Kansas, uh, the place where, if you remember when I talked about the Chisholm Cattle, uh, cattle Trail, uh, the, the, that was where the place where the trail ended, uh, where the major railhead was. Um, you know, uh, uh, Dwight Eisenhower first became famous uh, in the world uh, during World War II when he was sup Supreme Commander of Allied Forces in the Western Theater of Operations. Uh, General Eisenhower was the Western Theater counterpart to Soviet Marshal Zhukov, uh, who, who commanded Soviet forces in the Eastern, uh, Eastern Theater of Operations. So the top photo of General Eisenhower is, uh, is, is, is just before the Allied invasion of France in June uh, 1944, and he's seen talking to American parachute uh, troopers uh, just before they left on uh, for the invasion. Now, after the war, uh, General Eisenhower became active in American politics, and he was elected our 34th president of the United States, and he served from 1953 uh, to 1961. Uh, when he died in 1969, uh, his funeral was in Abilene, Kansas, and my father and one of my uncles drove out there and attended uh, uh, his funeral. He was very well respected throughout the United States, especially in Kansas. We were very proud of General Eisenhower, later President Eisenhower. Next slide, please. Now, Kansans today uh, have very diverse backgrounds. You know, in addition to the, you know, to the white, to the Native Americans that we talked about and the, and the white settlers who came and, and settled in Kansas, in uh, the uh, uh, mid to late 1800s, and the Volga Germans I talked about, who came a little bit later, uh, there are many Kansas uh, Kansans of Mexican an ancestry. So their ancestors came from Mexico. Uh, they came also in the 1800s to work on the railroads that were being built in, in Kansas. Also, many African Americans, many Black Americans, uh, came to Kansas, especially the larger cities like Kansas City and Wichita. Uh, in the early 1900s uh, to take advantage of new uh, jobs that were there, uh, new industrial jobs. You know, now, whoever came here, though, they brought their food with them. I'm, I'm sure you can appreciate that. Wherever people go, they bring their favorite foods with them, and those have stayed and become favorite foods of, of everyone in Kansas, regardless of, of their background. You know, the people who settled in Kansas in, in the 1800s and early 1900s uh, they were they were not wealthy people. Uh, they were you know, many of them were very poor. Even if they weren't poor, they were, they certainly were not rich. And they, they came to Kansas because times were hard and where they came from, uh, where they used to live. And they thought things would be better living and working in Kansas, you know, either on a farm or some other kind of job. So the food that they made, you know, it wasn't fancy. Uh, it often involved the kind of cheaper cuts of, of beef uh, that were not shipped back for you know rich people to eat back east. Uh, uh, these cheap cuts of beef, they were hard to eat. They're very tough. Uh, and, and unless they were prepared in a way that made the meat more tender and easier to eat. So uh, things were developed to take advantage of that. The slow cooked and smoked ribs, beef ribs that you see uh, on the top left, became very popular in Kansas and remain so. Um, this is called barbecue. I don't know if you've heard that word, but it, it, uh, it be, it's really popular throughout the United States, but it originated in the South with African Americans, and they brought it to other places uh, to include uh, Kansas. And barbecue, slow-cooking meat, smoked, uh, anyway, so it adds a lot of flavor to it. Uh, that, that's very popular style of food in Kansas. Now, the, the, the food that you see in the bottom left of photo is one that I like a lot. It's called Biro, uh, and it is a Volga German dish made from ground-up beef. Uh, again, the cheaper cuts that weren't expensive, 
uh, onions, cabbage, and cheese, and it's baked in a, uh, a yeast uh, dough pocket. Uh, this was a Volga German uh, food, and the Volga Germans brought it uh, uh, with them. My grandmother, you know, who, who emigrated from Russia, from the Volga German area, uh, in uh, 1912, she made this, and it was just delicious. And I've tried other people's uh, beer off that they've made. My my uh, 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 my, my mother-in-law uh, made beer off. She wasn't Volga German, and you could tell it, was, it wasn't that good. At least it wasn't as good as uh, as my grandmother's. Um, and uh, now, also uh, the um, uh, 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 the bottom right. Uh, you see a um, uh, steak and French fries that remains, you know, because of uh, beef cattle being raised in Kansas, that remains a very popular food, basic food, meat and potatoes <laughs> that it's called. And the upper right is something that's called chili. Uh, it, it came to Kansas from Texas uh, with people of Mexican ancestry. It's it, chili is a spicy stew made from beef. Uh, onions and and chili peppers. It's very popular in Kansas. Uh, almost every family has its its favorite uh, its favorite recipe. Next slide. Now, uh, sports are also popular in Kansas, both at the college and the professional level. You know, Kansas itself uh, is probably most famous for college basketball. With the teams from the University of Kansas being always among the, the, the top, the best teams uh, in the nation. You know, I, now I know Kyrgyzstan has a national basketball team. Uh, the University of Kansas team is, like I say, is one of the always the best ones in, in the nation. And um, it's been that way really since the beginning of the sport. In fact, the, the man that invented basketball as a game, you know, if you know the history, it's a fairly recent game. Uh, uh, developed in the first part of the 20th century in the United States. The man who invented it, Dr. Lawrence Naismith, uh, once actually coached, was the coach of the University of Kansas team. Now, there are no professional teams actually located in Kansas, but there are two in Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, you remember uh, from the map that I showed, there, there's two Kansas cities. The bigger city is Missouri, Kansas City, Missouri. Well, there are there are two professional teams located there that are very popular, though. They have lots of fans in, in Kansas. I don't know if you're familiar with American uh, football, uh, but the Kansas City Chiefs, uh, an American uh, professional uh, football team, uh, is uh, is located in Kansas City. That's the uh, the top uh, photo, uh, top right photo of the slide. Uh, they uh, they actually won the, the championship of American football uh, this last season. Also, the American game of baseball, which is popular in America and uh, in Japan and in Korea and not to in, in Cuba and uh, uh, nations in the Central America, uh, uh, Mexico in particular. But it's it's not too popular in any other in any other places in the world. It used to be an Olympic sport, but they, they've, they've uh, stopped that because, you know, it just didn't get the popularity outside of North America and Japan and Korea uh, that it has in the, uh, uh, that it has there. But anyway, one of the professional teams uh, is uh, the Kansas City Royals. Uh, and uh, anyway, both those professional teams, the Chiefs and the Royals, are very, even though they're located in Missouri, are very, very popular in Kansas and you know, I lived in a part of Kansas that was close to where they were. And when I was a kid, and, and when I return as an adult, I, I always try to take in the games uh, when I can. When I was um, when I was a child there, I, I, I used to go. My parents used to go to a lot of uh, of games there in Kansas. Uh, it was it was fun to grow up in Kansas. Uh, uh, really, did. we had a lot of fun things to do. Um, uh, uh, next slide, please. But. What wasn't fun in Kansas was mm -hmm. dealing with this, uh, a storm uh, called the tornado, which is uh, very common in Kansas, especially in the spring and the summer months. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of this type of storm uh, 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 or if you've seen it, uh, uh, but it's a very powerful storm that is in the shape of a funnel, like you see on the photo there. And it comes down from a cloud and when it hits the ground, 
it destroys everything in its path. Very, very high winds. You know, some, you know, sometimes uh, you know, just hundreds of kilometers an hour. Uh, tornadoes are very common in the central plain states like Kansas because of the weather conditions and the very flat land landscape that allows the tornado to travel very far without it being broken up by something like mountains or, um, uh, or forests. Uh, you know, I don't know whether you've seen uh, the, the, the American movie, The Wizard of Oz, uh, but that story started in Kansas with a tornado that lifted up uh, the, the heroine, Dorothy, uh, her house, and her, uh, her uh, with her little dog Toto with her, and it, it took it to the magical land of Oz. Um, one of my earliest memories as a very young child is when my father came into my room in the middle of the night and lifted me out of my bed and carried me into an underground shelter to protect me from a tornado that was coming very close uh, to our house. Next slide. So. That kind of wraps things, uh, wrap things up. You know, tornadoes aside, uh, growing up in Kansas was a great experience for me. Uh, although I don't live there anymore, uh, I, I have family there and I go back on, on a regular basis. You know, I, I was born in, uh, in that area and I, I, I went to grade school and high school there and I went to college and law school in Kansas. It was a great place to live. And if you ever get to visit the United States, you know, I... I hope you at least have a chance to pass through Kansas. If you just pass through Kansas on the way to someplace else with your father being in a great tradition. But we uh, we hope, though, that you would stay there and uh, meet the people and eat some of the food, like have a little beer rock, have some chili, have some, uh, uh, have some barbecue, and enjoy your time in Kansas. So I don't know whether if anybody has any any questions now, you can put it in the chat box. I can, uh, I can address them as best that I can. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Tom, for this uh, very interesting presentation. It was really fascinating uh, to learn more about Kansas State, its history, its um, I don't know, everything related to Kansas that you couldn't find on the internet. And also, thank you very much for sharing your personal story. It was really interesting to get you know about, I mean, about your family, yes, uh, history. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed this, and thank you for the invitation. Yes, we receive a lot of questions. Let me um, start okay. with the first question. Uh, has Kansas suffered any economic challenges due to COVID? Yes, very much. Its experience is similar to Iowa, where I am right now. Uh, and um, uh, really, every place has been, has been difficult. Uh, uh, there is such a, with COVID in the United States and the rest of the world, and I'm sure it's the same in Kyrgyzstan, there's such a collision of values. Uh, we want to keep people safe, which basically means we, we have to isolate. We have to limit uh, our activities that involve uh, being with other people. Uh, on the other hand, you know, people people's jobs and income uh, and life depend on that sort of interaction. Going to grocery stores, um, you know, people that operate restaurants, uh, um, and, uh, and and fam you know family gatherings. Uh, you know, we are right now in American culture a very important time of the year as far as holidays and family getting uh, getting together. But we just had a, a uniquely American holiday called Thanksgiving, uh, where families get together and are traditionally have uh, give thanks for what they have. Mm -hmm. And at this time of the year in the Christian world, uh, you know, uh, uh, even if you're not particularly religious, it's still culturally important. Uh, to, to America, the Christmas time uh, uh, season, and and you know getting together uh, is very very Im Im important. So, uh, yeah, we're we're having a tough time here as, uh, in Kansas as well as Iowa, where I am right now, uh, as as is the rest of the world. And we, we the vaccine for COVID is starting mm -hmm. to arrive in both uh, here I am where now and also in Kansas and the rest of the world. Uh, so hopefully by the end of this coming year. 
2021 with the vaccination, things will begin to return to, to normal. And I hope it does in Kyrgyzstan as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Hope so that soon this COVID will end. Thank you very much for your answer, Tom. And I think the next question, you already covered it in your presentation, but let me ask you anyway. Uh, do you know why Kansas was named as Kansas? Yes. How this uh, name was created? It was uh, after the uh, one of the Indian tribes, the Native American tribes that occupied Kansas, that lived in Kansas, mm -hmm. uh, called the Kansa. Uh, uh, and Kansas, in the Kansa language, literally means land of the Kansas. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, wow, well, we'll good Germans. Sure. <laughs> it's so interesting. I mentioned I mentioned the impact of World War II, which you know devastated mm -hmm. uh, the Soviet Union, especially the uh, the, the western part of it. Uh, and uh, uh, you know the Volga German community uh, was located uh, north and south around what's now Volgograd, called Stalingrad. And of course, everyone who knows the history knows what a terrible battle that happened at, at Stalingrad. And you know, the, before that, before that happened, uh, the Soviets, you know, were mistrustful of the German speakers there and moved them all out mm -hmm. into, into Siberia. Um, as late as the 1970s, my father. Uh, had um, and uh, we learned that he had an uncle that was uh, that was still living in Novo Sibirsk. Um, mm. No doubt he's passed on now. He'd be like mm -hmm. you know, 150 years old. <laughs> uh, uh, but um, uh, so the the, Vol the Volga German community uh, that has, has been you know, dis disrupted because of that. But you know. Uh, the, the Volga Germans, though, that, that moved to the United States, they still remain close. And mm -hmm. there's an association that I'm a member of that uh, that celebrates the Volga German uh, uh, culture. Uh, so it was very important uh, not only to, I think, Russian history, mm -hmm. but also to American history for what they did with the winter. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's so interesting. Do you have any special like holidays that you celebrated in your Volga community, uh, Volga German's community? Uh, no, not specifically for the Volga mm -hmm. German community, but the, you know, the, the traditional holidays at which were important in the European community, mm -hmm. which was brought to the United States. Uh, you know, certainly Christmas time and Easter, if you're Christian, uh, was, uh, was uh, very important. Uh, most of the Volga Germans were, uh, were Lutheran. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's and that originated in Germany before they came in northern Germany. Um, my family originally, before they moved to uh, uh, to the Volga German area of Russia, came from uh, the uh, the uh, the area of Germany known as Hesse. Uh, so uh, they were they were predominantly Lutherans. Mm. Uh, so they brought those Lutheran Christian traditions to the United States. Mm. See. Thank you very much, Tom, for explanation. Thank you. Uh, I think the next question is very complex, so it consists of several questions. Hello, interesting presentation. Uh, let me ask my questions. The first one is, have you ever seen a tornado? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> And it is, uh, it is, you know, it is very frightening. You know, tor tornadoes are are very different. Mm -hmm. You know, if you look on the internet and just you know and Google uh, tornado, you'll see different pictures. Some of them are very slender and look very mm -hmm. you know elegant. You know, others are just this massive mm -hmm. cloud that just you know comes down. Uh, in fact, it's so big you can't even really tell that it's a funnel shape. You know. Um, but I, 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 I have experienced both kinds of those. Uh, when I was a, um, uh, a, in junior high school, um, middle school, about seventh grade, around 12 years old, um, mm -hmm. I, I remember I was in um, science class. And uh, our, uh, our, uh, we, we heard uh, the sirens, which is how they warn people that there's a tornado in the area. Sirens go off. And our science teacher then turned and he held up, there's a barometer 
uh, mm -hmm. in class, and he said, you know, he said, look, the barometer is getting very low. That's a uh, that's a real sign that there was a tornado that might come. Of course, though, we weren't paying attention to him because we were all looking outside the window because we could see the tornado oh. come in. We did not need the barometer. <laughs> we, uh, we could see the tornado coming. And it was one of those little slender jobs, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so we all, you know, evacuated the classroom you want to get away from windows because you know the high winds can break windows and so you know you don't want the the broken glass so what well, we all we all congregated we all went into the central hallway and we and we we took books with us mm -hmm. uh our textbooks and what we did though we bent over and put the book the book mm. over the back of our neck to protect us in case there was some sort of debris or, or broken glass uh, that went there. The worst tornado that I ever experienced, though, was um, uh, when I was in, I lived in Oklahoma. You know, I told uh, everyone that uh, I was in the United States Air Force for 22 years. Uh, for uh, a while, I was uh, stationed in Oklahoma City, south of Kansas. But they have just as many tornadoes as Kansas does. It's the same type of country. Uh, so we we had uh, my family and I experienced what the worst kind of tornado there. It's called an F five. They have a scale of F one through F five, and an F five is like three hundred miles uh, an hour. I don't know what that translates into kilometers an hour. Many more than like maybe five hundred kilometers an hour wind. Um, it uh, it you know, and, and it was. And it was coming right at us, and uh, and because because of the kind of land in Oklahoma, there was no basements where you could go underground. So we were, my family and I were all together in a central hallway, but and we were listening to uh, things on the radio because we could we could hear it, and I could see it outside. You know, it was just it was com coming. Fortunately, just about when it was about oh maybe half a kilometer away it turned and it missed our house by maybe 200 meters or so and uh uh we we got we still got a little bit of damage from it but not much uh because it it, it missed us there was a lot of debris in the yard um and it, but in the neighborhood that was next to mine it just flattened everything mm -hmm. just 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 mm -hmm. destroyed and people were killed um it did it, it, uh, tornadoes are are are, are, ter are terrible storms uh you mentioned that uh the tornado has uh, levels scales yes. on s5 is, the, is this a high level Th that is that is the highest level i think you have to have um sustained winds uh of uh in in um using the American scale of miles per hour is uh, 300 miles per hour mm -hmm. uh, to be to be called an, an F5. Uh, oh, okay. uh, uh, I, I think, and I think that translates to around like 500 kilometers, mm -hmm. something, something like that. Oh, and, yes. and what about the edge? Oh, do, is it true that bison yes, just wrong? From around everybody. <laughs> they, they used to. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, bison, there were millions of bison in the Great Plains of the United States, from Texas all the way north to North Dakota to include Kansas, yeah. and uh, just millions of them. And uh, they, sadly, they were, uh, the, the population of uh, bison were also known as buffalo, mm -hmm. but bison is the correct term. Uh, the uh, they were they were slaughtered by white buffalo hunters who who uh, uh, the 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 fur of the buffalo was very popular in making clothing and coats and hats and things like that uh, and which were sold back east uh, to uh, to Americans and they they were just slaughtered and they would skin the buffalo and just leave the meat to rot it was terrible and terrible uh, so you don't see that many bison now, although um, they're coming back a little bit. Um, 
Uh, and, and mostly the herds are in uh, protected areas, mm -hmm. uh, national parks and things like that. Uh, 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 but uh, back during the, uh, the 1800s and before that, you know, they were just, there were just millions. There were just, uh, they were just everywhere. Mm -hmm. And that, the last question was about educational opportunities. Yes. Yeah. Yes. What about um, educational opportunities in Kansas? They, uh, they are as good as any place else in, uh, in, in the United States. Uh, there are excellent colleges and universities there. Uh, I've, I've mentioned where I went to school at Washburn University. I've also mentioned the largest university in the state, the University of Kansas. There are others as well. There's uh, Kansas State University, which is in Manhattan, Kansas, which is another Indian name, uh, which uh, uh, is, a, is a city that is uh, a little bit west of Topeka, Kansas. But Kansas State University is there. Also, there is Wichita State University, uh, in uh, in Wichita, Kansas, there there are and there are several others that um, they started out as uh, uh, there's like in Emporia, Kansas, in Pittsburgh, Kansas, and in Fort Hayes, Kansas. There are colleges that uh, started out as teachers' colleges. They were just two-year institutions that were designed just to educate uh, teachers to go out and teach in the public schools. Well, over the years, they evolved into uh, into much bigger institutions with much more diverse curriculum. Now they are a four-year uh, university. But there's lots of um, schools in, in Kansas. <clears throat> there are two law schools, uh, one mm -hmm. that I went to at Washburn, uh, and one that's affiliated with the University of Kansas. Uh, there's a very fine medical school uh, mm -hmm. that's affiliated with the University of Kansas as well. Uh, there are and many, many... Um, uh, students from uh, countries outside the United States come to go to school in uh, in, in, in Kansas. When I during my second year at Washburn uh, University, uh, my next door neighbor in the in the dormitory was a was a student from Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and and there there are there are many others uh, as well. So excellent opportunities in Kansas as well as uh, other areas in the United States. Yes, it's so great to have this wonderful opportunity. Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, the next question, uh, what is the population of Native American residing in Kansas State now? And what about other ethnicities? Yeah. Um, I, I do not know the population figures for, uh, for Native Americans in Kansas. You could probably find that out uh, with some internet research. Uh, for example, the, the Wikipedia articles uh, on uh, on really all the states in uh, Kansas or states in the United States and also countries of the world they will list percentage of the population of um, uh, by, by their ethnicity and the same way with other uh, ethnicities uh, as well um, uh, there's certainly there are far fewer Native Americans in Kansas than there were uh, originally uh, you know, the history of the United States with uh, the Indian tribes and Native American populations is, is, is a very sad history that, uh, that Americans uh, need to acknowledge and, and, and own, own up to. Basically, you know, they, they, were, uh, uh, they were independent peoples and, and uh, America conquered them and, uh, and then drove them, uh, most of them away from their lands uh, to territories that were set aside for them like in Oklahoma, uh, New Mexico, and Arizona, if you're familiar with those. Um, uh, and um, they were sent there because uh, white Americans, the American government, didn't think those territories had much to offer. Mm -hmm. So they said, well, this is a good place to send uh, our Indian peoples. Uh, well, later, they discovered that those places had lots to offer. Uh, you know, the... Uh, Oklahoma, very rich farmland like Kansas. Also, mm -hmm. great oil and gas resources. Mm -hmm. uh, New Mexico um, has great resources. Arizona has, uh, although there's lots of desert there, there still is great resources. And um, so, and, and when they discovered, well, where we sent these Indians, those are good places uh, too. So let's move them out of there. So it's not a it, it's not a, a happy uh, happy history 
and uh, uh, America has begun acknowledging that in, in, in recent years. I remember growing up in school, um, mm -hmm. nobody, nobody taught me how badly white Americans treated uh, treated native population. Nobody taught that. Um, now it's becoming, you know, uh, we've acknowledged that, acknowledged that more. But I hope that answers your question. I see. Thank you very much, Tom, for your answer. Uh, one more question from our viewer, viewers. Uh, are there any holidays or festivals that are celebrated only in Kansas State? Well, it's uh, um, the uh, in, in you know in Kansas we celebrate the the uh, uh, the common American holidays of course, um, uh, but there's also you know festivals and and events that are kind of specific uh, to to Kansas. Um, <laughs> there is a uh, I I can remember uh, when I was uh, eight years old in in. Um, uh, in 1961, uh, there was a big celebration for the centennial, mm -hmm. the 100th year anniversary of Kansas becoming a state of the United States. Uh, so uh, I remember there was a big festival there. Also, you know, I, I mentioned all the ethnic groups that uh, took to uh, uh, to the United States or to to Kansas. Uh, they they have a very specific festivals to those ethnic groups. Um, Mexican Americans uh, uh, that live in Kansas celebrate um, uniquely Mexican holidays like the Day of the Dead, uh, uh, which is uh, October, I believe, 28th. Um, uh, there also is, um, uh, uh, we, you, you know, you have... Um, like Volga Germans, you also had uh, uh, people from uh, other European ancestry, like uh, Czechoslovakians mm -hmm. and Poles, uh, and they celebrate holidays that are special to their ancestors as well. Uh, you know, Czech Celebration Day and things like that. So, yeah. mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. African Americans, um, you know, uh, celebrate. Um, uh, holidays that are important to the African American community. Uh, 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 really, everywhere in the United States, including Kansas, African Americans celebrate uh, uh, a, a Juneteenth. They call it Juneteenth, uh, which is June sixteenth, and that mm -hmm. is a, a date that's a very important to the eradication of slavery in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you know our history, uh, again, America has great history and it has sad history. Uh, America imported a lot of enslaved peoples from Africa in um, uh, in the 1600s, 1700s, and, and early 1800s and continued to hold them in bondage until the American Civil War in the 1860s. One of the things that resulted from that was mm -hmm. the eradication of slavery. So... Um, uh, uh, African Americans celebrate that, uh, and uh, I think white Americans should too. But it, it mostly is uh, African Americans that do celebrate. That. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see. Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, one more question: uh, What tips or advice would you give to someone who uh, going to state of Kansas? I would advise someone uh, to uh, visit all parts of the state. Mm -hmm. I think probably it's a, it, a might as well uh, uh, start with the eastern part, you know, land your airplane at uh, the Kansas City Airport mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and then travel uh, uh, into the Kansas City area, then work your way west. Um, uh, I, and it, it would be, uh, I think you, you should go to the, to Lawrence, Kansas and see the, uh, the university of Kansas, which is a very important to the state. Uh, you should go to Topeka, Kansas, where the capital and visit the state capitol building where, uh, our legislature, the, the Supreme council equivalent, where they, uh, uh, where they meet and where the seat of, of Kansas government is. Uh, then you should travel down, I think, uh, uh, through um, uh, Southwest, you should go to Wichita 
And along the way, you will go through an area of Kansas known as the Flint Hills. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Flint Hills has is a preserved area that looks almost exactly like what the original uh, wagon train settlers saw when they passed through Kansas. In fact, that photo I showed you of the flat rolling hill area, that's from the Flint Hill. If you want to know what Kansas looked like to the original white people that went through there or the original indigenous population, uh, Native Americans, uh, that's what uh, that's that's what it uh, that's what it, uh, it looks like. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, get on the interstate highway, you know, uh, 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 I-70, go back north and and just just head west and go all the way to Col uh, Colorado and maybe stop. Uh, take a detour to go up north uh, to Lebanon to see the geographic center of the United States. Uh, and, uh, and then, you know, go, you know, go out west and drive through the farmland and see, especially during harvest season, where you see just this oceans of, of wheat. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so, you know, I live in Iowa now. There's no, uh, not much wheat that grows here, but it's corn. And during harvest season, if you drive through Iowa, it is some of the most beautiful things you've ever seen. Just this, the way the wind waving the corn. And in Kansas, with the, the, the golden wheat, it's the same thing. It's just absolutely, absolutely beautiful. So, you know, maybe a trip during autumn, during fall, would be harvest season, would be good for that. And you'll see our farmers at work, you know, out in the fields with their machines, you know, harvesting the wheat. Uh, You'll see the uh, you'll see the cattle along the side of the road. Yeah. I say, yeah, when, when if you pass through Kansas, you will realize why Kansas is so important to the United States uh, and really much of the world as a source of food. Mm -hmm. um, thank you very much for your great recommendations. And I think it's the last question uh, from our viewers. Why there are two Kansas cities, one in Kansas, one in Missouri? It's so confusing. Uh, you, you would be, yes, it is confusing. Um, uh, there's no explanation other than it just is. <laughs> 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 that, uh, that, uh, that just, uh, it, you know, it really is one city that just happens to be divided by a state border. Mm -hmm. So it, because of the because of the state divides uh, the city, uh, it has to have two governments. Uh, but they just they, they just uh, named it the same. It is it is confusing even to our uh, uh, current uh, soon to be former president of the United States. <laughs> Pre president Trump did not know the difference either. He, uh, you know, I I, I mentioned that. Um, the uh, the American football team, uh, the Kansas City Chiefs, were the uh, American football champions mm -hmm. last year. Uh, so uh, after they won, uh, uh, President Trump uh, sent out a tweet on Twitter that said, "Congratulations to the great state of Kansas." Mm -hmm. Well, the Kansas City Chiefs are in Kansas City, Missouri. Mm -hmm. uh, so even he did he was confused about it. I see. There's no re there's no explanation. It just is. <laughs> I see. <laughs> Thank you very much, Tom. On this positive uh, note, I I want to close up our session. It was great to have you today, Tom. Thank you very much for the incredible and wonderful, very interesting and useful session that we had today. And I want to say thank you to our viewers who sent us their question. You are so supportive and active. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you for that. Thank you. This was, this was a lot of fun. Thank you for asking. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much, Tom, once again. And so see you in our next sessions. Have a great day. And uh, Tom, uh, congratulations with upcoming holidays. So thank soon, you. yes, we'll have this great uh, Christmas. Thank you very much, everyone. Please stay safe.